Welcome everyone to Match of the 80s, where despite the surroundings, I do mean the 1980s. The decade when we went from this to this. And where we replaced this kind of thing with this kind of thing. In short, a decade of absolute football revolution. And cliches aside, one of triumph and tragedy. Plus there was some seriously, seriously great games played. Oh, I don't know what you're saying, prove it. Well that's exactly what we're gonna do. In the early 1980s, English football success in Europe knew no limits. Tragically, at the same time, English football fans knew no laws. Whilst off the field the battle lines were drawn and crossed, a generation of media stars were stirring, with England captains and managers entering the ratings war. So, summer of 1980, let me bring you up to speed. Margaret Thatcher's at number 10, we have the England fans who have just rioted at the European Championships, and as unemployment tops 2 million, it does seem as if the only people working on Merseyside are footballers. <laughs> Liverpool had dominated the 70s with five championships, including the last two seasons. But now the champions were out to regain their European crown for England, with a spearhead of three Scots. We could handle whatever team our way. As a kid, do you want to play football with us or do you want to fight us? Because you know, either way, we're, we're, we'll match it. Straight by Hughes, going to Douglas, and it's the opening goal. Douglas celebrates. Over the years, we used to have this Scotland England thing. The two players I played alongside at Liverpool, who had will to win beyond anything that I've ever seen, were, were those two. Hansen. Yeah, even by traditional football song standards, this song was always a dog. Which was a shame because Spurs, in football terms, were rocking. They had Ardias and Villa and England's new star, Glenn Hoddle. We'll do one of them Saturday, couldn't we? Francis, and here's Hoddle. I saw a headline the other week that said, Glenn Hoddle finds God. I thought, blimey, what a pass. <laughs> And then, of course, there was Brian Clough, king of the castle and, alarmingly, top of the pops. Hi, it's Cluffy here, and football's my game. But it's more than a game. It's a wonderful sport. It's responsible for bringing together the people of the world. So let's look after it. Protect it. It's ours. It's a great equaliser. So always remember, at all times... You can't win them all. You can't win them all. Do you think it'll make the charts? I'm not sure about that. Why didn't you make it? I meant what I said. Yes. And I mean, who's it aimed at? It's aimed at the people that's causing us problems in football at the moment. There are a lot of villains about. Uh, there's 92 league football chairman for a start. <laughs> <laughs> well, despite falling attendances and Snoop Doggy Clough, White Hart Lane's fall as Tottenham opened their campaign against Brian's European champions, Nottingham Forest. No right to know you. Well, that might run for ideas. Was he pulled? Surely he was pulled. And the referee gives the penalty. No question that he was pulled by David Needham. Super through ball from Hoddle. And that's his first of the season. Crooks is away. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's brilliant. Meanwhile, deep in East Anglia, Ipswich Town were on the up. Future England manager Bobby Robson had gathered together a touch of Dutch and some native naturals to bolster his championship contenders. And then I would go up, in other words, I would, I would try and take them one way, bring them back and then take them again. Whereas if you just stand still, I think he reads you a little bit, I think he knows what you're going to try and do. 
Ipswich take an unbeaten record to Molyneux to face struggling Wolves. Just touched away by Villazan. Now Marino. Burley. Gates. Still in play. Brazil. 1-0. And they've got in front after being in defence for most of the match. Marina to number four, Tyson. He carved his way through, but it was tucked away by Marina. Well, that was quite remarkable. Just over a season ago, he was an apprentice cleaning boots. This afternoon, Clive Allen arrived at Arsenal's headquarters to a football star's welcome. He's already being called England's next Jimmy Greaves. Oh, cheers. Allen became the first million pound teenager when Arsenal paid QPR a staggering 1.2 for the 19 year old striker. Hopefully it's just the one move. I think now that um, I'm setting myself up for life. Sadly for Clive, those words were about to prove as genuine as a pop star's wedding vows. Within weeks, he'd gone to Palace. I was, you know, completely uh, bemused by it all. I, I found it difficult to understand, but uh, uh, obviously knowing Terry Venables very well, um, I said that I would go along and, and, and meet him and speak with him. And as we met Terry, he was, he was Terry. He was giggling and laughing. The one thing I do know is whenever I played against Arsenal after that, I nearly always scored against them. So in a way, I suppose that was, that was me paying them back. During his time at Palace, Clive featured in one of the most famous incidents of the 1980s. The goal that never was. Oh, what a tremendous shot by Allen. And the ball played up off the woodwork and Palace appealed for a goal. And they surrounded the referee saying it was in. And here's an incident. Clive Allen hammered that and it came back off the woodwork. Palace say it was over the line and the referee is going to have to consult the line. Hilariously, the linesman turns out to be as far from planet Earth as our referee. You can never tire of seeing how much of a goal this is, and how much the official says, no way! And the referee says no goal. You know, I'm paid to score goals, I know when I've scored a goal, and, and that was the case. To be home again, in England, to be where I belong, where I belong. When the lonely night is drawing in, I long to be with you in England. It's the ideal place to come to build up for the 1982 World Cup, which I see as my, um, if you like, my Everest, really. Inevitably, one of Keegan's first matches for Southampton will be at the Dell against Liverpool. It's going to fall for Sooners, and Liverpool have got five players in attack here. Sooners into the gap. Beautifully done. A goal by Sooners, but tremendous credit for off the ball running by Kenny Dalglish. All right across to Watson, and there's Nickel. This is Baker to Holmes. And Boyer nipping in. Boyer's there! Three in the centre. Berkloff! It was a bit of a jumpy start to the season by the champions with the greatest threat coming from unlikely Aston Villa, where you could find old hands like Dennis Mortimer and Peter Wythe, alongside sensational blonde bombshell Gary Shaw, and dynamic winger Tony Morley. Here's Tony Morley. Good running by him. Oh, what a great goal! Tony Morley scores a cracker. Managed by laugh a minute Ron Saunders, Villa were amongst the leaders as they welcomed Sunderland to Villa Park. Waiting in the middle. Collins! Oh, that 
Iverson, well done, Shaw, well there, he didn't really hit it through, but it went in all right. There was a rainbow over Villa Park, and all connected with the club were plainly cock-a-hoop. Well, you know, um, life's not just about laughing. Um, football is a serious business because it's your job. And um, it's nice to see that the players are beginning to get some of the credit that they deserve. Dull queues on Merseyside stretch further than most. And as these queues get longer this winter, then so the queues to get into the local football grounds are certain to get smaller. The attendances here were down by an average of 2,000 a game last season. They need 42,000 people just to balance the books. And the amazing fact at the start of this new football season is that even Liverpool can no longer pay their way with the money taken through the turnstiles. Of course, the day after Armageddon, you can guarantee a sellout for the Manchester derby. And so, 56,000 came to see United square up to bottom place City. Coppel's in there, so is Duxbury. McElroy, all off the legs and Coppel! Coppel! Oh, right across and in the back of the net. And Kevin Reeves came in there, and the defence was stranded as Reeves scored. Away by Booth, Arthur Augustin coming in. Oh, I say! Offside, was it? Oh, he's been given! Power. Peyton climbing, his Palmer with a great chance, it's there, Palmer has equalised for City. The City board reflect this creditable draw by asking Malcolm Allison to go, his year-long return to City ending in the sack, following a string of high-profile, bold and some may argue, over-ambitious signings. Another one bites the dust, and another one gone, and another one gone, another one bites the dust, hey. I can't satisfy the egos of some of the people in Manchester. The supporters have been absolutely fantastic, but you see, the directors are impatient. And I understand it. I understand it. Still, City are nothing if not a prestigious club, and candidates for the job are not slow coming forward. What was all that about there, eh? Useless, I don't know. Now listen. You gotta really keep it clean in this next half. Got 45 minutes to go, right? So I want you to get out there and really clean up, all right? Things have changed so much. Right. Now, without being disrespectful to anyone. Back up in the rarefied air at the tabletop, Ipswich face their first true test to Anfield. Bobby Robson stokes their psychic boiler. They'll jump and they'll fight and they'll compete and they'll win their percentages. Away by Johnson, only as far as Tyson! Tyson scores the goal that puts Ipswich ahead against the run of play. Sunnis. Cohen. Dalglish. Oh, the linesman's flagged for a foul by Tyson and the referee has given a penalty. Now, Tyson, the man who scored the goal, has been penalised and a penalty has been given to Liverpool for the tackle on Dalglish. Ipswich surround the referee, it looked innocuous to them. The linesman actually, in my view, made the difference there, he flagged. Oh, he went the right way, but it's still gone in. McDermott equalises for Liverpool with his 11th goal of the season for them. And Tyson is still arguing about the original decision. For Ron Greenwood and his England team, it had been a traumatic few months as they sweated on qualification for the 1982 World Cup Finals in Spain. An experienced England team led by Kevin Keegan and featuring a young and thatched Ray Wilkins had gone to the 1980 European Championships as favourites, but had been overshadowed by events as lunatics, thugs, maniacs and madmen grabbed all the summer headlines.
I'm sure the players are ashamed. It's a disgraceful exhibition. I'm certainly not proud to be British sitting there here at the moment. It wasn't a good day for Britain. In fact, it was a bad day for Britain. And we really are a splendid country. On the pitch, England bounced back in their World Cup qualifying group with a victory over Norway. Yeah, we have beaten Norway, and it came thanks to goals from Terry McDermott. Then Nottingham Forest favourite Tony Woodcock, now playing in Germany for Cologne. And a glorious, mad and brilliant goal from Ipswich striker Paul Mariner. In the days when Midlands clubs peppered the old First Division like pips in a pomegranate, things get good and grudgy as Birmingham City visit Villa Park, with Forest old boy Archie Gemmell writing off Villa's championship hopes. Shaw and Hawker get his this is. by Evans, and he got it in, yes, get it. Across town, big Ron Atkinson, he was always big, and his West Brom team are also going well. Inspired from midfield by Brian Robson, robust, injury-free and unstoppable. Robson, forward for Regis, back to Moses, and the goalkeeper loses it, and a penalty is given, I think, for handball. Anyway, it gives Gary Owen a chance from the penalty spot. Comes in the 35th minute of the match. And Bailey going the wrong way. 1-0 to West Bromwich Albion. Chance for a break with Regis. Barnes to the right. Somehow he managed to adjust his feet. But he didn't really make up his mind, I don't think. And Barnes has got through this time. Macari and here's Barnes again and Regis lovely cross West Brom's confidence was sky high as reflected in their almost Sinatra like ease in front of camera you got a beautiful smile <laughs> you got star. We genuinely feel that we can be the surprise team, that we can come right through the field. I don't bet. Although I think a 50 to 1 is a good chance. Cause you won't stop talking. Why don't you give it a rest? Despite West Brom's charge up to fifth position, the Christmas League table shows a three horse race for the title, with Liverpool, Villa, and Ipswich opening a gap at the top. third round of the FA Cup and a massive tie at Portman Road where Ipswich clash with fellow title challengers Aston Villa. Again the wind helped a bit then. There's Brazil. There's Mayer! Well deserved on the balance of play. Dumped out of the cup, Villa manager Ron Saunders has just a week to get his team up for an equally important league match as champions Liverpool roll in to Villa Park again oh he beats money too easily Gary Shaw with and Villa take the lead leaving it to Shaw on through to Mortimer who's onside could this be number two yes
joy, oh joy that was, because I just felt then 2-0 that, you know, we'd, we'd done enough that in that game then to actually put them out the race. Alex Ferguson's Aberdeen were about to pay for Liverpool's indifferent league form in the European Cup. Dubbed the Big Battle of Britain, it turned out to be simply the 5-0 thrashing of Fergie. Dalglish. Oh, nicely played by Johnson to Terry McDermott. And a little chip from McDermott. And what a lovely goal. Terry McDermott produces a special. Graham Souness almost single-handedly did for CSKA Sofia. Three players to his right, he's picked out Souness, who kicks out of beauty. And all this led to a semi-final clash with Bayern Munich. When we arrived in Munich at, at the stadium, there were leaflets all over the ground. And we were wondering what the leaflets were about and when we went into the pitch for the warm-up a Liverpool supporter gave us the leaflets and it was directions to Paris for the final so that really put our backs up Checking the watches on the bench Johnson, Kennedy is up suddenly in space and onside and scores! Ray Kennedy has given Liverpool the lead suddenly out of nothing the skipper gets the goal it changes the entire atmosphere Embracing on the bench, Ray Kennedy's goal has been enough to take Liverpool through to the European final. I can remember coming off and I actually put my head inside their dressing room and shouted a few things because they were rather arrogant about the whole thing, both in the first game and up to the second game. Also still in Europe, Ipswich are successful but paying a price. As part of an exhausting treble, they're in Germany. UEFA Cup semi-final facing FC Cologne. Taken by Mills. Oh, and the header goes in, and it's there, and Butcher came in. And Ipswich here have scored the goal that may well clinch the tie. And Terry Butcher got forward there, and Cologne were left like statues. No wonder they look so pleased on the bench. Cologne need three now. With no cup football to worry about, Aston Villa are enjoying life at the top of the table. Here, Southampton try their luck at Villa Park. Oh, a good knock on. Morley was onside. A great individual goal by Morley. Steve Williams. And Villa now fighting for everything. This is Williams, who's put Geddes away, surely! Meanwhile, for Ipswich, that treble bid is really starting to bite. In a huge game at West Brom, they even managed to look tired in an alarming tangerine kit. Oh, terrible confusion, and Albion has scored! Ali Brown gives West Bromwich Albion the lead. All these games come up thick, fast and heavy, and we were a, a big team, but a small club. And we didn't really have the, the extended staff of players. You know, we didn't have 20 quality players to see us through all these games. At Tottenham, new signings Garth Crooks and Steve Archibald look thrilled at the prospect of joining the famous old club. As Spurs square up to Wolves in the FA Cup semi-finals. Watch number six George Berry, a lazy leap of indifference followed by the old blame another bloke routine. In stark contrast to his later career as a broadcaster, Garth Crooks was a really exciting player. Just a joke, Garth. Oh, he's outpaced them. Crooks is there. Oh, yes. Number two for Crooks. Number two for Tottenham. And nobody, not even George Berry, can be blamed for this one. Ladies and gentlemen, the mighty Ricky Villa. Villa shot. Oh. 3-0. And Ricky Villa produces another marvellous moment for Spurs. 
Manchester City are also on a cup run with their new boss John Bond, taking on his own son and former club Norwich in the fifth round. Bizarrely, after the game, John Bond, for some reason, attempted a little James Bond. Son Kevin had his own view. Yes, uh, I think he fell off his wallet. Manchester City go on to a mouth-watering semi-final at Villa Park against double chasers and hot favourites, Ipswich Town. It is nil-nil, and after 90 minutes, extra time is being played for the first time in an FA Cup semi-final. Almost immediately, Ipswich have to return to the scene of their heartbreak for a league showdown against Aston Villa. For Ipswich to have to go back to Villa Park three days after their semi-final defeat was a bit like asking the body to return to the scene of the crime. But within five minutes of the start of what was billed as the championship decider, they were given the kiss of life. A long ball by John Walk seemed harmless enough, but Villa's Ken McNaught hesitated for an eternity and allowed Mariner to find Brazil for the opening goal. With 79 minutes gone, a second Villa error, Bremner's pass, led to Ipswich's second goal, scored beautifully by Eric Gates. That night we thought, we didn't say, I nearly said we said, but we didn't, we thought we'd won the championship. That's the way some games go. Um, but although we've only got four uh, games left and they've got five games left, that's a long way to go yet at this stage of the season. So it's uh, all to play for still. I think so. Do you want to bet against us? With Ipswich in control of their own destiny, Aston Villa must win their remaining games. Middlesbrough come to Villa Park for the last home game of the season. On the final Saturday of the season, the title race was incredibly still wide open. Villa needing one point at Arsenal, or for Ipswich to lose at Middlesbrough. So Sansom takes. On by Sunderland. John Hollins and McDermott's in there. Young! Willie Young! Jennings coming very confidently. What authority he's got. Hooked out there for McDermott to chase against Swain. And this is McDermott for Arsenal. He's got two to beat now. There's the first one. And he shoots in! What a fine goal by Brian McDermott! And the Villa fans are roaring again at the clock end. And Middlesbrough must have scored again to take the lead against Ipswich. And if they have, that's the championship for Villa, even though they're two down here. Amazing scenes, Ron Saunders is in the incredible position of seeing his own team two goals down but may still be winners of the first division title. Well, this is quite extraordinary if you think about it. They're celebrating even though their own team here have done nothing to help themselves. And the referee's blown and they're going for the dressing room as the crowd comes on because Aston Villa, beaten here 2-0, doesn't matter. They are the champions for the first time since 1910. 
so Villa were champions. But most impressive of all, they'd used just 14 players all season. The whole city turned out to greet them, even Birmingham supporters. Possibly. As for Ron Saunders, he went wild. I was part of a club that I supported and part of a, you know, a very, very successful period. Arguably, you know, the, 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 the most successful period in this club's history and may ever be. Meanwhile, Tottenham, in preparation for the cup final, have recorded that song, including this notorious line. In the cup for a thirteen hum. Your families, the uh, Ardiles family and the Villa family, have been listening to this interview in Argentina. I don't recognize mine. <laughs> <laughs> Do I gather there was a nickname at the beginning of that? Did I get that yes, right? Yes, uh, my name called me Lalito. Lalito? Oh, oh, yes. oh, oh, that's a new one we've got. <laughs> what a contrast between these two managers. Big John Bond, the amiable extrovert, who's shown a Midas touch in the last seven months. And nearer the camera, Keith Birkinshaw, a pipe smoking Yorkshireman, bred on a sound Barnsley diet of common sense and high integrity. Here's Ransom. Oh, and a flying header and a brilliant goal. Tommy Hutchison on the ground, and would you believe it? A fantastic header by the oldest man. Playing in the final. Ricky Villiers gone to the line. I should think they just made sure that Galvin was all right. But uh, Villiers coming off and disappointed he is too. The sad face of a man who's been withdrawn during an FA Cup final and a man who began it with such high hopes. This is Ardiles taking them on. Gal tries to get his tackle in and he does right on the edge. And could we see a Glen Hoddle special? Is he going to float it in for the strike force on the far post or will he try and chip Corrigan from here? And that was Hoddle. Oh, off Hutchison, it's in! Tommy Hutchison has scored at both ends if you call it an own goal. Hoddle will get the congratulations from Tottenham, but it went in off Tommy Hutchison. We'd done our homework on them. And where I went, I should never have been. But when you've scored the only goal in a cup final, you tend to want to win the game on your own. So, for the first time since 1970, and only the second time in Wembley history, the FA Cup final goes to a replay. So, away goes the sad figure of Ricky Villa. And there won't be many more poignant pictures than that from this cup final. I don't know what I was thinking at the time, but I know that I did something on impulse, which I never would normally do, and I, I went up to him and I said, get your head up, you'll be playing on Thursday. And uh, he was just transformed, because he thought that he wouldn't be in that match. And, uh, of course, as soon as I said that to him, he opened up like a flower and he was all smiles. And, and it, re it was reflected in the way that he played. So, still Spurs with Ardiles. Brilliant. It is Archie Ball has got a chance. A good save, Ricky Villa. Ricky Villa scored. And it was made by his fellow Argentine, Ozzy Ardiles. Ransom with the kick. Miller, Reeves underneath it. And now Hutchison to McKenzie. Oh, tremendous goal! Steve McKenzie! Fabulous shot! On by Reeves to Bennett. Paul Miller trying to check Bennett. Down goes Bennett. Penalty! Penalty! Keith Hackett had no doubts. David Bennett has won a penalty for City. 
No, penalty has never been missed in an FA Cup final at Wembley. The last one was 1962 for Spurs. And here comes Reeves, and it's there. Kevin Reeves keeps up the record. Hoddle. Oh, the chance here for Archibald. Cooks. 2-2. Two, two. Villa. And still Ricky Villa. What a fantastic run. He scored. Amazing goal. By Ricky Villa. The big man from Argentina went round one, two, three. Joe Corrigan came to block and Villa squeezed it in. And so it's fitting that in the year of the 100th final, it's Steve Perryman who takes the cup for Spurs. Uh, code red, security to Royal Box. Two men appear to be kissing each other. Then there's Ipswich. Poor, tired Ipswich trying to salvage something of their season. They take a 3-0 lead to AZ Alkmaar in the UEFA Cup Final. Just an hour or two before the game, I remember leaving the hotel. And I, there was Mickey Mills, I think Bobby Robson was in the elevator and we got stuck in between floors. And it was like, absolute, it was a hot house. And by the time they freed the lift and we got to the bottom, all the other lads were in reception waiting for us. And we all got out with just an underpants on, it was so hot, dripping a sweat, and boiling. So that wasn't the ideal preparation. Away by Arn Tyson. Oh, what a start for Ipswich. They scored. And the Dutchman, Franz Tyson, put it into a tremendous position here. Mariners putting it on. Johnny Walk's in there. Johnny Walk. John Walk equals Al Cavini's record of 14 goals in Europe. We knew we'd let ourselves down and the league in the FA Cup, so we knew we had to get something. It would have been injustice if we didn't win anything. They chased three trophies, they missed out on two, but they finished up with one. The first European trophy in the club's history. The European Cup is to be decided at the Parc de Prince in Paris, where Liverpool face... Alan Kennedy! The unlikely man again! I didn't realise that I'd scored the winning goal. Ran off behind the goal, all the Liverpool fans are there, they're all trying to get on the pitch like, you know, and I've done it, yeah. You know, I'm no nostalgia freak, but can it really be that long ago when the whole of Europe quaked at the prospect of facing an English side on the pitch? How can we get it back in this day and age? How, how can we guarantee British success in Europe? Well, there's one way. It's an old idea, but, you know, it, it might just work. Hello, I, I wonder if I could have a word with you a second. Um, I just... By the way, tune in next week and hear Terry Venable say, I have seen the future of football and it's green and artificial. <laughs> More football magic from 1981 to 82 next week at the same time on BBC One. To the decade before that next on BBC One for some classic albums. When the Spurs go